Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to session one of VectorWorks Marionette Monday. I'm Robert Anderson, Vice President of Integrated Practice for VectorWorks Incorporated. I'm here with Sarah Barrett, a member of my team and one of our outstanding VectorWorks evangelists. We're really excited to be bringing to VectorWorks users and to fans of algorithmic design an important new platform for you to realize your design visions, one that we call Marionette. As many of you know, generative design is a design method where sets of rules or algorithms, usually in the form of a computer program, generate part or all of a design. We've seen some fantastic examples of such algorithmic design over the past few years, and Marionette unlocks the potential of algorithmic design for vector users. But algorithms that are based on programming languages are kind of difficult to learn, to use, and, and especially to decipher. They lack the immediate results and malleability needed for the design process. So Marionette employs a familiar and easy to use flowchart metaphor to allow you to assemble useful programs using wires to direct the flow of data and create your design. Most importantly, these programs are easy to understand and easy to modify by people who don't have a program background. We designed Marionette to be fully integrated with VectorWorks, complete range of CAD and BIM capability. This means that not only can you use it to create organic designs, but to prototype custom parametric objects and to automate other design processes. Over the next few sessions, we'll lead you through an in-depth training that will expose you to the full range of Marionette's capabilities, but really, your imagination is the only limit. A quick look ahead is in order. Today's session is part one, Marionette Basics. In two weeks, We'll have a session on Marionette Intermediate Techniques. The week following, we'll have our first Marionette Advanced class. Then, two weeks after that, we'll wrap up formal training with a second advanced class in Marionette. All the classes will be recorded, so you'll be able to go back and pick up the details. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention here that we have some great Marionette events planned for our upcoming design summit, scheduled for April 25th through 27th, in Chicago, so you should make plans to attend if at all possible. More details about this in the coming weeks and as part of our advanced marionette training. With all that lead in, I'd like to introduce you to a valued member of my integrated practice staff, Sarah Barrett, who will be your marionette trainer. Sarah has a background both in architecture and in algorithmic design, and she's going to be our guide to all things marionette. Um, before I turn it over to Sarah, I'm going to quick house housekeeping comment. Please use the questions box to submit questions. We will answer live some of the questions, but we'll respond with an FAQ response on our user forum uh, Marionette page, so that because there are over 500 of you signed up. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Sarah as we change over. Hello, everybody. Welcome again to our Marionette webinar. My name is Sarah, and I'll be your trainer today. So what is Marionette? Marionette is the new graphical scripting interface for Vectorworks. Vectorworks has had scripting capabilities for a long time, but as Robert said, code-based scripting can be difficult to learn and implement, and hard for non-programmers and visual learners to use intuitively. Marionette makes scripting much easier to use, but to get started with Marionette, it is still useful to understand some basic rules of coding and scripting, mainly what is an algorithm and how is one created. Algorithm is defined by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary as a step-by-step -step procedure for solving problems or accomplishing some end, especially by a computer. An example of algorithms in everyday life might be assembly instructions for a piece of furniture or appliance. Another example might be a recipe for making cookies. Every algorithm needs two things, data and operations. Data, or parameters, are the pieces of information you start with. Operations are the actions you take or the commands you apply to your data. In mathematical terms, data are your variables and operations are your functions. If we look back at our assembly instructions, we see we have information on what tools and parts are needed to complete the assembly, as well as how to put them together. We have our data we have our operations. Or in our recipe, our data would be the ingredients and their amounts, 
and the operations would be the instructions for combining those ingredients. What is a node? With Marionette, we can create algorithms using nodes from its node library. Nodes are the individual pieces, each datum or operation that make up a script. Where are the nodes? This library of nodes can be found by clicking on the Marionette tool in the basic tool set. When you click on the tool, you see a drop-down menu as well as two modes, insertion mode and debug mode. In order to access the Marionette nodes, insertion mode must be highlighted. We'll get to debug mode later in the webinar series. When you click on the drop-down menu, you see a list of node categories. And when you click on a category, you see the nodes in that category. To select and place a node, click on the image of the node you want, and then click on the drawing space. Like all Vectorworks plugin objects, it stays selected. So if you keep clicking, you will place more of the same objects in the drawing space. To deselect the tool, simply use the selection tool or press X. To help us understand how marionette nodes work, we can start with identifying its different parts. Most nodes have both input ports and output ports. An input port is a white circle on the left side of the node where information is applied. An output port is a white circle on the right side of the node where data can flow from one node to the next. Each input port has a name that helps identify the type of data to be applied to the node. And each output port has a name that helps identify the type of data that will be supplied by the node. In this case, the two input ports are center point and radius. This tells us that one input will be a 2D point, and the other input will be the radius or a real number. These purple nodes with no input port are called input nodes because they are used to supply the data that starts definition. Although there is no input port on the outside of the node, data can still be applied to the node by typing it into the object info panel. If you click on the node, you can see that there are boxes where you can type in the information you need. To build a network, we have to connect the nodes together. The connection between two nodes is called a wire. It is what allows information to flow from one node to the next. To create a wire, first select the node and hover over the blue square in the output port. Click once when the arrow shows, and then hover over to the node you want to connect to and click once on that input port. The nodes are now connected, and even if you move the nodes, the wires remain attached. Why don't we connect this one as well? A series of connected nodes makes up a network. It does not matter how many nodes there are. As long as it can perform a function, it's a network. It can also be called a script or a definition. This is Marionette's interpretation of an algorithm. So if we want to see how a familiar algorithm would look as a Marionette network, let's go back to our recipe for grandma's cookies. We know that this recipe creates one batch of cookies. And if we think in these terms, that every ingredient and instruction is based on making one batch, we can build an algorithm for any number of batches we want. Below the recipe, I have added some simple measurement conversions that we will need. As you can see, we need several nodes to accurately describe each ingredient in the recipe in terms of the number of batches. It is set up this way so that if we change the number of batches, all the ingredients would be automatically updated. Not only do we have to put the ingredients in terms of batch number, but we also have to convert all the different measurements to one single type. Just as if you were putting dimensions on a floor plan, you would always use the same unit. For the second part of the recipe, the mixing instructions, our marionette network would look something like this. Each action must be spelled out as if you were telling a computer how to make this recipe. You would have to tell it how to break and beat an egg and exactly how and where to combine ingredients. There is a limit to this, though. 
And that is where the specific nodes come in. Every node has a script inside with a predefined command. And this is why it's important to know what each node can do. We will get to that in a minute. But first, a little more about the basics of a marionette network. Information always flows from left to right within a node. And as long as wires are connected in the right order, it doesn't matter where the nodes are placed in relation to each other. This network works the same as this network. The second network is easier for us to read, so I would recommend keeping your nodes flowing from left to right across the screen in the order that they are connected. And if you're a perfectionist like me, you might get caught up trying to align your network perfectly. It can be very satisfying, but it also is a huge waste of time. I don't recommend it, uh, although I understand it, that it can be hard to resist. Another important aspect of Marionette is naming. Naming comes into play in several ways when using Marionette, but we are going to start with naming nodes for your own reference. When you select a node and go to the Object Info panel, you see that there is a box labeled Name. Every node can be given a name to help you remember what that node is used for the network. This is especially useful when sharing your network with others. In this network, we might want to name the input nodes to remind us what they're being used for. We could name the point to node uh, circle center point. And the real node, circle radius. As you can see, the names we give the nodes are now in large print on the outside of the node, and the node type is in smaller font below the name. The word we use to implement a network is run. If we want to see what a network can do, we have to run it. To run a network, you simply right click on any of the nodes and select Run Marionette Script. The other way to run a node is to select a node in any of the nodes in the network and go to the OIP and click the Run button. So let's run our network. The result of the network appears as the coordinate specified. The result is always selected when it is first created. So if it is not visible after the network is run, you can click on the Fit to Objects button in the top of the, in the menu bar to view it. As you can see in the OIP, the geometry is created as a group and it is named. All resulting geometry is named marionette group and then something more specific to connect that object back to the network. In this case, it is named marionette group circle 10. The number is not important to us. It's only an internal identifier for Vectorworks. If we double click on the group, we see that it only contains the circle we created. If we want to change a network, or change some part of our network and run it again, the new geometry will replace the old geometry. So let's say we want to change the color of the circle. So we select a new color, and we run it again. So we can see the geometry has replaced the old circle, and the name remains the same, marionette group circle 10. So if you want to keep the geometry you ran and create a new geometry as you run it again, there are two ways to do this. One, you can ungroup this geometry, and that will disconnect it from the marionette network, or you can rename it. So it's still a group and still named, it just has a different name. So let's move it to the side a bit. Let's change our color again and run it again. We see that new geometry has appeared that doesn't replace the old geometry. In order to fully utilize the myriad of nodes that are in Marionette's node library, it is helpful to understand what nodes exist and how you can find the nodes you're looking for. As we mentioned before, algorithms have two types of information, 
data, and operations. Marionette nodes, likewise, can be separated into two different groups, data and objects. Each of these types can be separated into two more categories. Data can be separated into data creation and data manipulation, and objects can be separated into object creation and object manipulation. We look at a sample network that creates a series of polygons. We can classify the nodes in this network into these four categories we just mentioned. In this network, the categories can be shown in a specific order, but this is not always so. The more complex a network, the more likely these four types of nodes will become intermixed, but they will always work together in the same ways. So let's see what type of nodes fit into each category. One way to figure out what a node does is to look at its color. This is a bit of an oversimplification, oversimplification of the color system, but it's a good place to start. As you can see, purple nodes most often deal with data creation and collection. And nodes that range from brown to gray tend to deal with data manipulation. Blue and green nodes deal with specific objects and their creation, while pink nodes deal solely with object manipulation. Within the Marionette node library, data creation nodes can be divided into three categories. Input nodes, get nodes, and object info nodes. These are the nodes that begin a definition. Data must be entered in the OIP of the node. These nodes supply the basic criteria of a definition. And once a definition is complete, these are the nodes you use to alter the definition to change the variables. Input nodes are located in the input library under the input name. Get nodes. Nodes that begin with the word get are used to extract data from existing objects. Get nodes always have an input for an object, sometimes a specific type of object, like a 2D poly or a NURBS object. This is why get nodes are often located in their relevant object categories. As you can see, these nodes are all different colors because they are used to extract data from different types of objects. Or in the case of the get opacity node, it is part of a separate yellow category that only deals with attributes. It is located here in the node library. Almost all nodes in the object info category are get nodes. The reason they are in their own separate category from the other get nodes because they can be used with multiple types of objects. For example, this get2d point can be used with any 2D object, be it a polygon, polyline, or a line. Object info nodes are located here in the library. Data manipulation nodes are the nodes that change data. Two examples of data manipulation nodes are data flow nodes and map nodes. Now, data flow nodes happen to be my favorite kind of nodes because I find that they're the ones that really bring power to Marionette. All data flow nodes only have inputs that receive data and outputs that supply data. These are the nodes that make sequencing and repetition possible in Marionette. They're located here in the library. Math nodes serve a similar function to data flow nodes, except that they deal specifically with mathematical functions. They're located here in the library. The third type of node are object creation nodes. And the nodes that do this in Marionette are the object nodes. Object nodes are in the different node object node subcategories, depending on the type of object they create. An object creation node always has the type of object as its name. So this object creates a sphere, and its name is simply sphere. They're located here, uh, the different lists of objects throughout. The fourth type of node, the object manipulation nodes, can be divided into three categories. Nodes that have names that start with a verb, other than get or set, are nodes that manipulate objects. Action nodes that only apply to specific types of objects will be found in that object info category. Oops, thank you. 
Sorry, these are action nodes. Um, they each have a verb to start the node, and you can tell that they, they perform an operation on an object. So now we go to set nodes. Nodes that begin with the word set are, us are used to apply new data to existing objects. Set nodes always have an input for an object as well as an input for data. Set nodes are often located in their relevant node categories. Set nodes that deal with multiple types of objects can be found in the object info category in the node library. Before we found the get nodes in the object info category, you scroll down, you see that there are also several set nodes that can be applied to different types of objects. Nodes in the operations category are all action nodes. The reason they are in a separate category from the other object manipulation nodes is because they can be used to manipulate different types of objects. And they are located here in the library. Does anybody have any questions at the moment? Can multiple but not all nodes be selected and moved at once to help keep a network looking clean? You can definitely do that. And the way to do that is simply to drag the marquee over, um, over a network. So let's go back to our sample network. So to select them all, just drag the marquee over all of them. And you'll notice that if you try to drag the marquee over nodes that have a wire stretching past, they don't select. So you have to go all the way across the wire to select them. Uh, nodes are not connecting on the input or output. Now, this can happen if you happen to be in a view other than top plan. So even if I'm in top view, if I try to click on my, my wire, I can't edit it. So if I switch back to top plan, the blue square appears again. So let's continue. So if we go back to the network where we classified the nodes, we can see how they work together. The data creation nodes in our network are all input nodes. Some of the data they supply is then changed by the data manipulation nodes. These are two data flow nodes and one point node. We have not mentioned point nodes before, but they are an important type of data manipulation node. They specifically deal with points, which are not quite objects. The object version of a point is a locus, and there is a separate category for loci in the object nodes list. Here. And as you can see, our points are located here. The data from these nodes is then applied to the object creation node, specifically a node that creates a regular polygon. And then this polygon, in fact, a series of polygons, is then manipulated by the move node. Now that we have seen examples of how the different types of network nodes work together, we can try building our own network. So if we want to try to build this network from scratch, we see that this network creates a grid of loci inside an existing polygon. A network like this could be applied to a more practical purpose, like creating a column grid on a floor plan, for example. If you look at this network, we see that it starts with a name node, an input node that allows you to reference existing geometry in your marionette network. So first, Let's draw our own polyline to start our definition. Let's go to a blank space on our Mary, in our in Vectorworks and draw a polyline. So now we want to attach this polyline to a name node. So let's get a name node out from the input category in our library, place it on the drawing. So in order to connect them, we need to give this poly a name. And in order to give any object a name, you click on data in the object info panel, 
and you see a box for a name. So we'll name it shape01. And since we need to give the exact name of this shape back to the name node, let's copy it. So now we go to the name node, and we can paste it right into the object name. So now this node is attached to this poly, and it'll be a part of the network. The option to create a duplicate object is available in this node in case you're going to be doing something that will delete the object within the network. But since we're only overlaying a grid on it, we don't need this checks. So next, we are going to um, get a bounding box node, because we want to know where the geometry is and what are the points that surround it. So a get bounding box node is a get node, uh, and it applies to multiple types of objects. So it's in the object info category. So let's place our bound get bounding box on the drawing. Press X and connect our name node. So what we get from this are two points, the top left 2D point of the bounding box and the bottom right 2D point of the bounding box. Technically, this will give us XY coordinates for each point. And we know in a bounding box that the top left point will be the minimum X value and the maximum Y value and the bottom right point will be the maximum x value and the minimum y value. So we need to extract the x and y values from these points. So we go to points in the library, and there's a node called get xy. So all it does is gives you two separate values for an xy point. So now that we have these values, we want to create a range between their minimum and their maximum in order to get a list of values that will go across the polygon. So we're going to go to data flow and select a range node. So we want a range for both x and y, so we'll need two range nodes. So if we look at the description of a range node, it creates a range of numbers between start and stop. So we need the starting number, the ending number, and the number of steps between start and stop. So for the x range, we know that the starting number is the minimum x from the top left point, and the stop number is the maximum x from the bottom right point. And likewise, the start point for the Y range is the bottom right point, and the max Y is the stop. So now you want to take a moment to name these so we remember that this is our X value and this is our Y value. So this name does not change the network in any way it's simply for our own reference. So there's still one more input port on these nodes that we need to fill. We need to get the number of steps between start and stop. So we go back to our input category, and we get an integer node. An integer node is for whole numbers. It's used when you are counting things, when there's no way you would be able to give a fractional value. So let's connect our integer node to our count on both ranges. And we're going to do both because we, just, we want a square grid. So there will always be the same number of points in each direction. So we can give this a value of 15. And we'll name this as well to remember what it is. The next node we'll need is a mix2 node. 
Because what we have to do there we go, is return these to x and y values to point values. And we need to make sure that there is a y value for every x value. So we'll go over mix2 node a little bit. It's a very powerful node. If you select it, you see it has a drop-down list of four options. So basically it matches two lists that you put into the input. So if we do a shortest list, if we do two lists that have different lengths, it'll cut off the longer list to make it equal to the short list. And if we choose longest list, it will repeat the final value of the short list until it reaches the length of the long list. The cycle list does a similar thing to longest list, but instead of repeating the last value, it starts at the beginning and cycles through again. The fourth type of list matching that we want to use, though, for our, no our network is the cross-reference. So cross-referencing allows every combination of these two lists to be put together. And it looks a little bit like this. So we connect our two ranges. And we go to the OIP and select cross-reference. Also, when I use this node, I like to name it as to what list I'm using, just to remind me when I look at my network. So now we have, we know that this list is um, the list of x values, and this is the list of y values for every x value imaginable. Well, not imaginable, but in our, in our list. So now we want to turn these two lists of values back into a point. So we need to go to the points menu and find the point 2D node. So it's the counterpart to the XY node. To get XY node, the input is X and Y, and the output is a point. So now we have a grid overlaying our shape. And if we wanted to see the grid, we would have to turn the points into loci. So let's get a locus node. And attach it. So let's run this, see what it looks like. So we have our grid of points, but as you see, it's not in the poly only. It's actually in the bounding box that we gave it first. So we have to change it a little bit. And we're going to find the node we need in the objects category for poly 2D. The node is is in or on poly. So what it's asking for are the points and the poly that we're referencing. So put the points in. And we attach the poly that we referenced in our name node. And we have an output that gives us the points that are there in the poly. So we'll attach those to the locus node. So zoom in here. We run our network again, we see that now it's only giving us the points that are inside the poly. It replaced the old geometry because uh, even though we added a node to the network, it didn't really change. So say, so now that we have this, this is where we can do interesting things, where we can start to change um, the values or the poly itself. So say we want to change the number of grid spaces. 10. Just change that number to 10 and run it again, and it changes. 
Also, say we wanted to change the poly. We want a different shape. And now we run it again. And the grid adapts to the new poly. Do we have any questions at the moment? How do you get the info from an existing object? Does it have to be in the network? So this question was kind of answered by, um, by this network. Mainly what you use is the name node. To it's, it's the de facto way to connect any existing piece of geometry to a network. Um, and the only thing you have to do to change that geometry is to add a name to it in the data, you can see in the data uh, tab of the object info panel. Is there a library shortcut? There actually, at the moment, there are no library shortcuts, um, but that's definitely something that we want to look into as we develop Marionette further. You can use the line, oh, so can you use align and distribute tools to organize nodes? You can to a certain extent. Um, the, the one issue with that is once you connect nodes in a network, the wires also become part of the node. So if you try to organize these three nodes uh, by spacing, so we go to line distribute objects, and we want to distribute them evenly by space, it doesn't really work because the, the, it takes account into the wire, it takes the wires into account. If you really wanted to do this, you can disconnect them and then align and distribute them and reconnect them. It does work though if you just want to align, align them left. So. It wasn't easy to see. Let's do that again. Let's see, is Marionette specific to VectorWorks Architect? No, it's not. Uh, it can be used by uh, Landmark and Spotlight, and I actually I recommend it for both. Um, there are just like this, creating this grid of points. I could see something like this being very useful and laying out a light plot, or in Landmark, um, in laying out a site plan. Uh, what version of Vectorworks is Marionette in? It is only in Vectorworks 2016, um, Vectorworks 21. Uh, it came out this September. How do you turn a network into a script, and can you place it in a script palette? There is a way to turn a network into a script, although this might be a little advanced for some of our other users, um, but I can show you quickly. So all you do is you right click on any node and you save Marionette script to Python network. And then give it a name and it saves as a .py file. Any other questions? How do we know the kind of input to apply to the node? So, when we look at our different nodes, let's get a typical node that probably everybody has used or wants to use, a rectangle node. And we look at the names of the input ports. It's not always blatantly obvious what they mean, but usually you can extrapolate what you're looking for if you know what you're trying to build. So when you build a rectangle, you need a point to tell you where the rectangle is, and you need a width and height. But if you're still a little confused on what these need, you can go to description in the OIP, and it tells you a little more about the node. So if we go to the input nodes, Um, we have several no several types of inputs. Uh, we can go over these quickly. So 
we have three types of nodes that input number values. Uh, real and dim. So the integer node puts in whole numbers, so like a count of something. And uh, for a rectangle, we would not need an integer because the no two numbers we need are distances. So they can be a fractional distance if necessary. So we would either use a real node or a dim node. Real stands for any real number, whole or fractional. And dim stands for a number with a given dimension unit. Now, this only comes into play if you want to transfer your different marionette networks to another file with different units or to a different layer. This way, it'll always keep the dimensions that you've given. If you use the real, however, it'll always use document units. Um, so the other input that we would need in this is the origin. So that's asking for a point. And in our input category, we have two types of points, point two and a point three. Since rectangle is a 2D object, we know that we're going to need a 2D point. And as you can see in the OIP, the options for X and Y values are there. If we click on the point three, we see X, Y, and Z. Robert, do you have any questions? Um, I'm glad you showed the description button. I think that's really a helpful thing for people. Um, you know, we are constantly under development on Marionette. We're constantly under development on Marionette, and we will be uh, there will be improvements to Marionette in the next uh, major release of VectorWorks. Um, and some of that will be driven by your input. So please send us uh, your comments. All your comments that are going into questions in the webinar will be recorded, and we will be putting together an FAQ uh, on the forum page, uh, on the Marionette forum page. So um, uh, we're we're looking for your input, and we will try and answer uh, all your all the significant questions that we get out of the webinar today. What do you? What else do you have, sir? Anything? Uh, there is a quick question about this node, and since we have it on the screen, oh, I'll explain. Sure. Uh, the fourth input for a rectangle is orientation. And this is specific to the, um, the script command that was written for a rectangle. Uh, it's an old script that was written for Vectorworks a while ago. And in this case, orientation refers to the rotation of the rectangle. Um, and it doesn't give you tell you exactly what it's asking for. But there's another way to find out what each of these inputs needs. And you can double click or click on the edit node, on the edit button in the node. Now, this may look really scary to some people, um, but it's a way to figure out what you're looking for. So this is the code behind the node. It's completely editable. Um, you can change whatever you want. But if we look at these four different lines that say marionette port in, that is what each of these, how we get each of the input ports. And so we know that the first one was called origin. And as we can see in these parentheses, it's asking for an xy point, uh, which we would write in parentheses 0, comma 0. In the width, we have a single number. So it's just asking for a real number. And same with the height. And as you can see, the orientation is asking for another xy point. Well, in this case, it would be an xy vector. And um, for as this is the default, one comma zero is is how you would write the orientation of a rectangle without rotating it. So for the most part, unless you are familiar with scripting and you've used this before, I would just ignore this input because you can use the rotate node later in your definition to rotate your objects. So that concludes our webinar for today.
Thanks for joining our first Marionette Monday webinar. We will pre-register you for the upcoming sessions. February 1st, February 8th, and February 22nd, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And for those in Australia who also have Eastern Standard Time, it is the time zone for New York City and Washington, D.C. So reach out to us with any questions at hello at vectorworks.net.